Now, I've known Phil, known in inverted commas, for a long time, actually. Although, we don't speak very often. We, li we actually, I didn't even know he lived in Swindon, and I live in Calm, which is 12 miles away from you, I think. Something like that. But we kind of know each other by sight from being beaverers away at Kew. And Phil's one of those people that when I first went to Kew, when I was about 19, four years ago, that, <laughs> um, I always saw Phil, and I always knew that he was an expert. And anything that I would ever need to know, I knew that actually if I kind of sidled up to Phil, I could probably go, excuse me, but can you help me do this? Even though he doesn't work there, he's just a researcher. And I got in touch with him actually via a friend, good friend of mine, Sarah Minnie, who was very rude about me last night on Facebook, I saw. <laughs> um, and she put me in touch with Phil when we were looking to put together the conference programme. Now inside the programme there's information about Phil, I'm not going to work, read that out for you, you can um, find out more about him in there. The one thing I will say is he's a pen and sword author, he's written copious books about the topic that he's loosely talking about today, which is World War I. Um, so without further ado, I shall hand you over to Phil, and Bob is currently rifling in his pocket. <laughs> which I hope is just to get microphone not to steal the money that he came up with. So I'll hand you over to Phil Tomaselli. Thank you. Is that the microphone working? Yep. Yep. It seems to be. Good oh. Right. A little bit more about me. I don't know what they've written in the in the pamphlet. I am in fact Northumbrian, but you wouldn't think so from my accent. Uh, Born in Northumberland, raised in Bristol, lived in Exeter for about 12 years, and have been living in Swindon for the last 25. And it's not as bad as you possibly <laughs> imagine. Uh, it's close to a lot of nice places. That's probably the best thing you can say about it. Um, I actually cut my teeth on local history 40 years ago when I was given a project at school to do something on your local area. And since the local area I lived in was a housing estate built in the 1960s on a greenfield site, it seemed appropriate to do something on a little tiny hamlet called Queen Charlton, which is a mile or so over the fields. Uh, this was back in the days before the internet, before word processors, anything like that, where if you wanted to contact an archive, you actually wrote to them in a handwritten letter, and they sent you things by the post. And I spent months doing a project on the history of this village, which I never completed, never published. It was better than anything anybody had ever done before, I think. And it's been mouldering in my father's loft for about 40 years. Um, so if there's one thing I want you to take away from this today, when you've done your research, when you've finished it, write it up and publish it, please. Otherwise, it will moulder in somebody's loft and then get thrown out when somebody dies. Um, the First World War and localities. Awful lot of work has been done and is being done on what you might call the big picture. The big personalities, Haig, Lloyd George, the generals, the battles, the Somme, Passchendaele. Awful lot of work is being done on the small picture by family historians who have discovered that their ancestor fought in the war tracked him down and found out what he did. Uh, local history, I think, kind of brings the two together because people lived in locations, they worked there, their families were there, their background was there. So much of what they did was influenced by the kind of place that they lived. Um, much less so these days, I think. Uh, I've lived next door to a chap for 20 years, and I think I've been in his house twice. I speak to him every day, but I don't know most of the other people in my street. It was different in those days, and I think it's important that we remember that. We do tend to see things through the lens of the Second World War, where there was much more big organisation, Every, all the lessons, or most of the lessons from the First World War had been learned so that, for example, conscription came in on day one <coughs> of the Second World War. You had no option. There was no question of volunteering, that kind of thing. Um, munitions productions and things were centralised at the start of the Second World War because they weren't at the first, during the First World War and people had to learn what they were doing. And I think there's a couple of other things that we need to remember about the First World War period is that most people, most average people, had no 
connection with the state at all. Most people couldn't vote. No women could vote. At least 40% of men couldn't vote because there was a property qualification. So that most people didn't vote for their MP and probably didn't know who he was. No national health service. Only a very rudimentary national welfare system. Um, which provided some unemployment benefit for some workers and a basic old age pension that had only been started three or four years before. Uh, so the vast majority of people, though they might be paying into the fund through national insurance, got nothing back, had got nothing back out of it. Most people didn't pay tax. They might pay duties on things that they bought, but fewer than one million people paid income tax at the start of the 20th century. And even by 1939, it was only 20%. Police forces were local, far more local than they are now. So if you got involved with the police, it was somebody local in your local, from your local borough or your local county. Unless you committed a really serious crime, you were tried by a justice of the peace who was local and who quite probably knew something vaguely about you, especially if you were a ne'er-do-well from the area who was up before and before. The only national institution that most people came into contact with was the post office, because the post office delivered their letters, their postcards, and provided the one banking service that people could rely on. Awful lot of people had an account with the post office. During the course of the war, central government involvement in people's lives increased massively. But at the start of the war, barely any involvement at all. Let's talk about the army. Almost every county in England had its local regiment. There were some counties that were so small they were deemed not large enough to support one, like Cambridgeshire and Herefordshire and Monmouthshire, depending whether that's in England or Wales. They were an artificial creation. They were dumped on the counties in 1882 uh, in an attempt to get recruitment locally. Prior to that, you could join a regiment that was nominally called the North Gloucestershire Regiment. You could be from anywhere. They would send recruits out wherever they happened to be based and pick people up. And it was decided in 1882 to give each county a regiment, base it in the county, and hopefully it would recruit locally and build up a sort of what we might now call a corporate ethos, but I don't think they'd use those words then. Um, there were peculiarities. I live in Swindon. Most of what I'll be talking about is about Wiltshire, so you will excuse me. The Wiltshire Regiment was formed of two battalions, one of which had been a Scottish regiment for as long as anyone could remember, and all of a sudden 800 Scotsmen were dumped down in the middle of Devizes and told they were now the Wiltshire Regiment. <laughs> By the start of the First World War, after about 30 years, the local regiment tended to be full of local people. But you can't guarantee that because you weren't obliged to join the local regiment. And there were plenty of regiments, cavalry regiments, the Royal Artillery, etc., that recruited across the whole country. So nominally local regiments, but not necessarily strictly. The one military institution that really is local is the territorial force, what we now call the territorial army. It's changed its title several times. Part-time soldiers, recruited locally, lived locally, trained locally part-time. <coughs> they had their uh, drill halls, which you still see scattered about small towns. There's one in Swindon. I gave a talk in Canterbury in a drill hall there. Uh, they were run by county-based committees, so the local bigwigs were involved. And they formed up into regional divisions, the Western Division, Northern Division, Lancashire Division, that kind of thing. So they had very much a local ethos and a local focus. Uh, Swindon, because it had a big railway works, full of engineers, provided a company of Royal Engineers to their division. Um, as with ordinary soldiers, after the war, all their records were taken up to London and, of course, most of them destroyed in the Blitz in 
1940. But you will still find, quite often in your local records office, records of the territorial force, registers, uh, sets of accounts, reports talking about which particular units had done what, and well worth it as a source if you can find one. One plea I will make on behalf of military historians and family historians generally, because so many soldiers' records were destroyed uh, in the Second World War, for an awful lot of people, there's very little information about them. Now, 1918 election was the first election in which all men over the age of 21 were entitled to vote. And because the election was held so quickly after the end of the war, they produced what was called the absent voters roll for soldiers who were serving, not necessarily even abroad, but they might be on garrison duty in Doncaster when they came from Devizes. So the Devizes roll, for example, would have details of all the soldiers who were away, what units were they were in, not just their regiments, but often which companies they were in, or if it was in the Navy, what ships they were in. Those are invaluable for family historians. So many of them seem to have disappeared. No one can find any for Wiltshire, but if you find any, please, please, please make it public. I know that Bridport have just discovered their absent voters roll recently uh, and found it an absolute gem. The volunteer movement, often overlooked, it was a bit like the First World War equivalent of the Home Guard. Awful lot of men who weren't fit to serve, who were too old to serve, or had jobs that were too important for them to be conscripted or taken away, still wanted to do their bit. And the volunteer movement, it began in 1914 when men of my kind of age said, I want to do something, got together as local groups and decided that they were going to do sentry duty, guarding bridges, guarding railways, things like that. Gradually, the government incorporated them using the 1804 Volunteer Act uh, and placed them all under the command of the county sheriff. The volunteers bought their own weapons. They wore a brassard or an armband with GR on it, inviting the comment that it stood for Grandad's Regiment. <laughs> Gradually, the War Office gave them uniforms. Gradually, they were incorporated into the bigger picture of the War Office. Records for these are extremely sparse. <coughs> but all across, they were all across the country. All of them did their bit. And again, if you find anything, it is worth look it is worth letting people know where these kind of records might be. The only real place I can think I've ever seen them is in regimental museums, because towards the end of the war they were grouped together as nominal battalions of the local regiment. So you might find the 17th brackets volunteer battalion of the King's Own Royal Lancasters, and you might find something like that in the regimental museum. Conscription. British Army didn't have conscription. British government didn't want conscription at the start of the war. There had been people who talked about bringing conscription in prior to the war because most foreign countries, France and Germany, for example, conscripted everybody over a certain age, gave them a certain amount of training and kept them in the reserve uh, till they were about 45. So they could instantly call out armies of millions of men. We couldn't and we didn't. We tried to rely heavily on volunteers, and it was very successful, at least at the start. But by the end of 1915, it was painfully obvious that the volunteers were not keeping up with the levels of men that were needed. So in January 1916, conscription was introduced. All single men between 18 to 45 were liable to be called up. They later extended the, it to married men and to men up to 51. Now this was all organised nationally uh, 
by the Ministry of Labour. But you could appeal against it, and appeals were all organised locally. And if you can find the appeal papers, I've seen so many people say, oh, there are no appeal papers anywhere. Well, there's an awful lot of them in the Wiltshire archives, tucked away. Occasionally, one hears of other papers tucked away somewhere else. If you can find them, they are an absolute godsend for telling you about what the local population were doing, why they thought they shouldn't be conscripted. Being Wiltshire, awful lot of them are farmers, and an awful lot of them are saying, both my sons have gone to the army, I am 39 years of age, both my sons have went to the army, I'm running the farm on my own, I have a 70 year old mother who is dependent on me, please don't conscript me. Most of them were, in the end, though an awful lot of them were given extensions so that they could be there for the lambing or there for the harvest and that kind of thing. Small businesses, for some reason, I don't know why, coal merchants in Wiltshire seem to have got off lightly. Possibly because it has no supplies of coal of its own and coal being main fuel, coal has to be got from the depots to the houses and people needed it in winter. Um, Again, if you can find records of your local conscription uh, review committees, please let people know. Women. I saw a video yesterday in which someone described the women as the unsung heroes of the war. Um, and probably yes, because with so many men being called up, I mean, they tended to go for the single men, but as married men were called up, so many women were left behind running their households on their own. There was an attempt to get a register of women for war service organised by the Ministry of Labour. Quite where the records of that have gone, I don't know. They were probably held centrally. But thousands and thousands of women went to work. In July 1914, there were only 2,000 women employed in the government dockyards, factories and arsenals. By no November 1918, that had risen to nearly 250,000. Transport industry, nearly 100,000 by the time the war came to an end. And between 1914 and 1918, at least one million women were added to the British workforce. Again, records of them are <coughs> sparse. You will often find things in local newspapers, but it is worth remembering <coughs> that as well as the women who are staying at home, so many women went out to work, probably for the first time. Awful lot of them went into munitions work, the munitionettes, I think they were called after the suffragettes, and worked in factories. <coughs> tending to do the kind of work that skilled men didn't do, partly because the skilled men were heavily unionised, and not that they were against women in particular, but they were against unskilled labour being brought in, because they saw that as the back door by which the employers would bring in unskilled work after the war. Um, so there was a fair bit of resistance to that. But an awful lot of women came in as teachers, I know from a study I was looking at in Swindon that an awful lot of women teachers went in to replace male teachers. Awful lot of women went into office work and things like that. This is for the slightly more educated woman. Um, on one of my pet subjects, which is the history of MI5, uh, I know they recruited some of the brightest and best and most intelligent women in the country by going to the ladies' colleges at Oxford and Cambridge, Cheltenham's Ladies College and places like that and asking literally who are your best women with languages and organisational skills and they took on hundreds of them who worked for them over the course of the war. So plenty of opportunities there for women. The vast majority I suspect didn't do paid work at all but there were endless opportunities for women to help out generally. Most regiments and towns ran comforts for the troops funds and had committees, prisoner of war aids committees, 
A friend of mine, about 10 years ago, was doing some work for a little old lady in Swindon and mentioned he was interested in the First World War and she said, I'll show you what I've got in my loft. As a very young girl, she had worked for the Wiltshire Regiment Prisoner of War Release Fund, Relief Fund and at the end of the war, when they closed the fund down, nobody knew what to do with their records and she took them home. And she kept them in her loft. And <laughs> I still, I don't think, though there are some records of the fund in the Wiltshire Records Office, I still don't think he's finished working through them. Uh, he used it in part to do an absolutely excellent book on Swindon and the people who went to war. Um, but there must be other records out there, and I would ask you if you find them again to make them public. Now... Women knitted well in excess of two million pairs of socks for the troops. I know that the Salisbury Needlework Guild sent thousands of parcels to prisoners of war and to Wiltshire men at the front. Their records are all in the Wiltshire Records Office. But I'm not sure you'd necessarily think to look in a Needlework Guild records <laughs> for records of the war. Uh, and they're invaluable because the soldiers all wrote back and said thank you. They tend to be slightly formulaic, the letters, as if the sergeant was standing over them saying, <laughs> write and say thank you very much for the nice pair of socks which I'll graciously appreciate it because they all tend to run like that. But they have, again, the soldier, his number, his regiment, his company, and sometimes even his platoon in them. Uh, so they're well worth looking for if you can find them. Another set of records might be worth looking for. I enjoyed looking for them when I heard about it. A subject so abstruse I've written here that I don't even think it has a Wikipedia page. And that is the National Horse Census. Yes. Um, the Army, then as now was run as cheaply as possible and never had enough horses to do what it might be required to do. When they saw the war coming, which they saw the war coming round about 1908, 1909, they couldn't have, they didn't know it was coming, they thought it might be, the army actually sat down and devised a plan whereby using the Army Act, which always allowed them to go and commandeer, horses and equipment from people at a moment's notice, decided this was how they were going to proceed in the event of war. The British Expeditionary Force, which they worked out who was going and where it was going and what it was going to do, on the outbreak of war would take horses from all the up units that were staying at home, and the units that were staying at home would take horses locally. They'd purchase horses locally, but you didn't have much option. They came and said, we are taking Dobbin and the price is five guineas. Then, so they organised the 1909 horse census, which was carried out by the police, because the police were, you know, being local, knew where the horses would be, knew where... the farms were that had lots of horses, knew where the companies were that had lots of horses. They carried out the first census in 1909. There was a slight problem in that the police weren't horse experts. They could go along and say, it's got four legs, it's a horse, um, and possibly it's a big horse or a small horse. And one or two police, senior police officers, actually said that they didn't like doing it because they felt it broke the sacred trust between the public and the police. In that they were making a list for the army to come along and take away people's horses. Uh, so the 1911 Army Act made the responsibility of the territorial force. And they did. They went round, they went to farms, they made lists of horses, they made arrangements for their collection made arrangements for where they were to be sent to afterwards. Lots of, these, lots of the details of these are available in the Territorial Force records if you can find them in the county area. 
and lots and lots of people complained. Uh, there are a few thin files on the Wiltshire Horse Census where various farmers complain about it, and it gives you lots of information about the kind of work that was being done on the farms, why they needed the horses, why they didn't want to lose the horses. In fact, in August 1914, you've probably all seen the film War Horse, where the boy's horse gets taken away by the army. Um, they would have known about that. They were the horses pretty much were numbered by the army who said, in the event of war, we are coming for that one, that one, and that one. Uh, they took the horses, they paid the farmers the money, 135,695 horses were requisitioned immediately within days of the start of the war. And by June 1915, they'd requisitioned 70,000 heavy horses, 8% of the total used in agriculture, and 25% of the entire saddle horse stock of the country. These are the ones that officers could ride uh, and possibly gunners in the artillery and that kind of thing. So they were forth then to rely on importing horses, first of all from Canada, then as far afield as Argentina. And to cater for them, they built an entire organisation which was countrywide under the Army Remount Service, which had brought their horses in through Liverpool and Avonmouth docks, had big special re reception camps at Ormskirk near Liverpool and Shirehampton near uh, Avonmouth. There was a training depot at Romsey and a depot near Southampton that sent the horses directly to France. But every army command, there was Southern Command, Western Command, Northern Command, Eastern Command, had across its command a whole series of collection stations, training stations, all there for working with horses. I know that Eastern Command had depots at Pluckley in Kent, Brentwood, Luton, Market Harbour, Kettering, Red Hill, Bedford. And the Brent I'll start again. The Brentwood depot had a sub depot uh, at Elsenham near Bishop Stortford, which collected all the wicked horses from the Eastern <laughs> Command for special treatment. <laughs> and I was delighted to discover that just down the road outside Swindon, a little village called Purton, uh, there was a farmer Brown who had a small horse training farm that was specifically for army horses. So again, it's something worth looking out for. And one little thing <coughs> which tickled me when I read about it, because again, it sort of comes back to uh, War Horse, the film. At its peak, the army had 870,000 horses. Most had been brought in from, a war, from abroad. At the end of the war, 133,000 horses were brought back to Britain to be sold. In fact, there's a lot of kerfuffle in some of the War Office files about whether it's more important to bring horses back or men. Uh, they decide in the end it's men, because the men start getting uppity at the thought that their transport's being used by horses. 200,000 horses were sold in France. Some were actually sold to the Germans, provided they paid in neutral currency. 44,000 were actually sold to the French for meat. Um, the army did bring in a scheme, which again goes back to War Horse, where if you were a soldier and you worked with a particular horse, and you were about to be demobilised, and your horse was about to be demobilised, a lot of soldiers approached their commanding officer and said, I would like to buy Dobbin as my horse. We've worked together for the whole of the war of the last couple of years. The army wouldn't let them do it. There were no rules that allowed soldiers to buy horses. There were rules that said all horses had to be auctioned, and the army wasn't going to break its rules. What the army did say is there is no rule that prevents us telling you when that horse is coming up for auction. And you could register a particular interest in a horse, and when that horse actually came up for auction, you would receive a telegram from the war office, which I presume you paid for, saying your horse is coming up for auction 
in Chelmsford on such and such a date. How many soldiers took it up? I don't know, but I know some did. I've seen stories of soldiers who actually travelled or sent their father, if they were still in France, contacted Dad. Dad went and bought the horse and took them back to their farms. We're getting a little bit away from local history now. Um, perhaps I ought to say something about businesses. Main problem that businesses had was, of course, labour shortages. Once people began to get, men began to get called up, uh, businesses began to suffer. The conscription, pa the conscri conscription committee papers are full of small businesses saying, I can't really afford to lose Fred. He's the only bloke I've got who hasn't gone to the war. I need him to keep my business going. Um, again, awful lot of them were called up in the end, but you do tend to see individuals given an extra bit of time, a few months, whereby they could help the business sort itself out over a period before they went. And some of those give nice little snapshots of individual businesses in areas and the conditions they were going through. Um, it did provide opportunities for women, which I have mentioned. The war also provided lots of business opportunities. You tend, we tend to think, or I tend to think, having just been to the Imperial War Museum's exhibition on the First World War, of the munitions factories as huge, absolutely enormous factory operations. Some of the photos I have there, rooms four or five times as long as this room, just full of shells, full of material, full of machinery, cranes running along the roof, and men and women working in them. There were huge factories like that. There was an enormous one at Gretna Green, uh, just on the Scottish side of the border from Carlisle, that they set up and ran. But an awful lot of small businesses took the opportunity to take subcontracted work on doing bits and bobs of shell manufacture. But of course, the army needed huge numbers of other things, uniforms, badges, webbing, spades, horseshoes. Awful lot of companies small manufacturing companies took on that work and did very nicely about out it. I did some work for a local history group in Bridport where the main industry in the town was fishing nets. They still make nets. If you go to a Premier League match these days, I am assured that nine times out of ten the goldmouth nets are actually made by Edwards Nets in Bridport. What on earth could they use fishing nets for? Two things. One, camouflage netting. Huge amount of camouflage netting went out to France to camouflage the guns. Awful lot of that was made in Bridport. And the other thing, nets were designed to catch fish, but they made wire nets designed to catch submarines. And hundreds and hundreds of miles of metal fishing nets and some standard fibre nets, were laid across the channel, across the mouths of estuaries, around ports, designed not necessarily to trap a submarine, but if a submarine got caught up in the net, it would pull the net away, and at least in theory, because each net had floats on the top, you could see the gap in the net, you could, at least in theory, see the submarine towing it away, and that would alert the naval authorities. So that's one small industry. No doubt there were scores of other small industries in the areas that you work, you are researching, that might have been able to do business with the government. How are we doing for time, Kirst? 10.39. Then I'd best hurry up. You're all right. We've got until 10 past 11. Don't we? Oh, well, I can grab it on for England, so... <laughs> it depends whether people are going to have questions. Other things to look out for... Being in Wiltshire, of course, the, the, the county became pretty much an armed camp because Salisbury Plain had been used by the army for a couple of generations as a training ground, and indeed it still is. You can't drive from Swindon to Salisbury without going through places like Tidworth, which still has a garrison, and seeing uh, the signs saying, careful tank crossing, 
In all the time I've driven it, I have never seen our tank on that road. But it, it must be out there somewhere. Um, <coughs> as well as the established camp, there were scores of camps set up for training of soldiers, recuperation camps for soldiers, depots. They even built a Royal Flying Corps aerodrome right on top of Stonehenge and they were flying the biggest, heaviest bombers they got off of there. Fortunately, none of them crashed, at least not on the stones. So all around, all around the country are uh, these localities. Some of them were just fields that were designated as emergency landing grounds for aircraft in the event of, of a problem. They're all out there. I doubt there's a central register of them, but they're worth looking for. Local landed families. I'm pleased to say that I have never actually seen Downton Abbey. <laughs> but I gather that in Downton Abbey, at the start of the war, uh, all the men put on uniforms, even the ones who were a bit too old for the uniforms. The older men tended to go and do things like run the local territorial force, run the volunteer units. Uh, most of the younger sons, whatever else we might think of them, saw it as their duty to go and serve in the army or the navy, mostly the army, and of course they were slaughtered in their thousands. Um, officers were a natural target, and the Germans looked for them and they shot them before they shot anybody else. There was an article in the paper the other day, John Cleese, the comedian's father, had apparently joined up as an officer in the First World War and resigned his commission because he said they are shooting the officers. Having resigned his commission, he went back in as a lance corporal and survived. So an awful lot of the local landed families lost one or more of their sons. I'm doing a lot of work at the moment in Highworth, which is a couple of miles up the road from where I live, where our local branch of the Western Front Association have their meetings. Um, and on the Highworth War Memorial, there are the four Brown brothers from East Rock Grange, which is a medium-sized house on the edge of the village, where the Brown family, who were connected with the big local brewery Arkles, lived. All four brothers were killed within 18 months of each other. And they have a memorial window in the church and appear on the war memorial. So the local landed families, always worth looking at. Going back to the conscription committee papers, I found one, an appeal not put through by Lord Lansdowne himself, but Lord Lansdowne owned Bowood House, which is a big stately home just down the road from... Um, and his chauffeur was called up. Now, Lord Lansdowne didn't write to the committee, but his estate manager did, <coughs> pointing out that Lord Lansdowne needed a chauffeur because not only was he a member of the House of Lords, but he was also on the territorial committee. He sat on various other committees involved with soldiers' relief and things like that. Not only him, but his wife sat on the committee of the Officers' Family Relief Fund, was a commandant of the local VAD, Voluntary Aid Detachment Hospital, and again sat on lots of the aid committees, and therefore it was felt appropriate that their chauffeur should be excused military service because he needed to run them around. And I think he wasn't called up. Why someone said, why doesn't Lord Lansdowne learn to drive? I don't know, <laughs> but he probably didn't in those days. Demobilisation. When the war came to an end, how do you get the men back again? And what effect does it have? The army actually worked out a demobilisation plan at the end of 1917, early in 1918. And they even did a desk exercise to see whether it would work. Um, 
when the event actually came, the armistice still took virtually everyone by surprise. Most people expected the war to drag on until spring or summer of 1919. All of a sudden, you've got several million men in France and they all want to come home. They tried to bring out the men that were needed first. Coal miners in particular, we were desperately short of coal. We needed experienced miners back from the army. Any man that it was thought might be an employer. So small businessmen who had gone into the army were brought out in the hope that by coming back they could provide employment for men who would follow them out later. After that, it was sort of first in, first out, at least in theory. Didn't always work like that. Um, there was a surge in unemployment after the war. Many employers had guaranteed to keep jobs open for men who volunteered to go. I know they did in Swindon, the railway works in Swindon promised to keep the jobs on for the men who had volunteered to go. This, of course, meant that many women who had been brought in to fill the jobs temporarily were dumped back, I was going to say on the street, but that sounds a bit, but sent away from the paid employment they had been used to. And the unemployment did cause problems. I mean, the one I know about in particular is the great Swindon flagpole riot, because to celebrate the end of the war, the council spent £250 on a celebratory flagpole to be put up outside the town council offices, and they held a ceremony to inaugurate it in early 1919. Just outside Swindon, there was Chiselden Camp, which was a huge camp. It's not there now. If you know where it was... You can vaguely see where it was, but otherwise, you could, I drove past it for years before I realised. And it was full of men who'd been sent home from France who hadn't yet been demobilised. And a lot of them turned out to the ceremony, along with a lot of unemployed soldiers who'd come out already and still not found jobs, and complained that the council had spent 250 quid on a flagpole when they could have spent it on trying to provide work for the unemployed in Swindon, or the money could have been spent, better spent trying to speed up the demobilisation process. A fair bit of drink was taken. <laughs> and in the end, some soldiers, I've heard they were Australian, but no one seems to be sure, actually cut the flag down, flagpole down and burnt it, <laughs> and drove off the local police, who seemed to have been reasonably sympathetic, in fact, to them, um, they arrested a couple of men that they thought were ringleaders, but let them go next day without charge. And the police inspector was torn off a strip by the chief constable of Wiltshire for doing it. And for a couple of days after that, there were riots in Swindon. Unemployed people, so it was said, usually that an awful lot of the local ne'er and wells broke into shops and things like that before eventually bad weather and a heavy-handed police presence put it down. But there were disturbances like this across the country, not on a grand scale, very few people were hurt, um, very quickly forgotten about, I think. But again, something to look for. And a scheme that was a national scheme my wife though her father was a cockney ended up fighting in the uh, King's Own Royal Lancaster Regiment by a convoluted set of processes um, so she developed a fascination with the Lancaster Regiment and we went to Lancaster one day we were talking to a local chap and he said um, have you seen the Memorial Village? We didn't even know there was a Memorial Village. One of Lancaster's good and sturdy citizens, his son was killed fighting in the 55th West, West Lancashire Division. And he decided that 
what was needed by way of memorial to the soldiers who, was ki who were killed were not just memorials with lists of names, but he suggested that everywhere in the country should set up a memorial village that provided homes and small business facilities for injured soldiers. Now they built one in Lancaster. The money was provided by Lancaster Council and veterans of the 55th Division, and it is still there. It was taken over by a housing association in 1989, but it's still there. It has its war memorial. The houses are all named Song, Passchendaele, Combray, even today. And there are about 30 houses built specifically for injured soldiers. Now, I know of other projects. There was one in Norwich, one in Welling Garden City, the Hague Homes, one in Leicester, and another one in Hampshire, whose website is rather confusing because though it says it was started in 1922, it says it was funded by money from the Egyptian government, thankful for El Alamein. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was originally founded in or around 1920. I suspect there are others out there. I have occasionally driven through, when I used to live in Devon, occasionally, dare I say, I used to go knocking on doors for the Liberal Party in Devon, and you would go to a small close of houses that were obviously built round about 1920-ish, closely grouped, not exactly council houses, not exactly arms houses. They tended to be full of older people. And I always wondered whether they were ones that were built specifically by the locality as something to do with commemorating the First World War. I never followed it up then. I was too busy doing other things. Um, I often wish I had, but I suspect there may be scattered across the country small groups of houses like this that were specifically built as a practical way of commemorating what went on during the Great War. Now, I've come to the end of my script. Apart from what I have written to go as an actual screed, something to read out. It says, as I hope we've seen, so much of the backdrop to the actual fighting of World War I occurred locally. Localities rallied round in all kinds of ways to do their bit, and to quite simply, help their members survive. There are an awful lot of small groups that were designed, self-help groups for women whose husbands were away to help each other to send things to their men abroad. I'm sure there are many points that I've not raised that you're aware of, and that's surely the point of all our individual World War I projects, to dig these things out and ensure that the efforts made then are not forgotten. So I would urge you to do your bit, get out there, get researching, write it up, and ensure that what the people in your locality did is known, is known about in the future. Go to it. <laughs>
you will call me up only when I'm absolutely required and I can then go to that regiment. And it did produce volunteer, more volunteers, but never enough to fill the gap. Um, men who volunteered in late 1915 were called up March, April, May 1916. So all they did really was defer their entry. But you will often find it, if you're looking at a family, uh, family history, if you find a soldier's record, it will say enlisted September 1915 and then later down called to the colours on April 1916. So it, it, was a, it was a brave attempt to avoid conscription but it, it was never going to work. Brilliant. Another question? Thank you. We hear quite a bit about the massive growth in women employment of the World War I period. Yeah. But looking at my place in East Lancashire in the 19th century, the census, an awful lot of the women were working then in the mills. Is there any data on re regional variation on the extent of this uh, increase in, in female employment? There is, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> Fair enough. It exists. No, they, I, I've... I go to the National Archives a lot, as Kirsty has said, and I do know that there are sets of papers drawn up, mainly by the Ministry of Munitions, which tends to look at munitions work, on regional figures for women's employment and that kind of thing. How well you could compare that with women's employment uh, before the war, I don't know. But there are figures out there, um, I just never looked at them. I think I actually thought you used to live in the archives when I first saw you there. <laughs> you were there every time I was. <laughs> I, I found some of those uh, soldiers' houses that were built after the war in Barnsley. Really? They were built with the leftover funds from the Prisoner of War Relief Fund. Ah. There are four houses. There are two sets of semi-detached uh, houses built on the edges of what later became a council estate yeah. and they're distinctive because they're slightly larger than the standard council houses. The procedure for putting <coughs> men in them was to take um, applications from soldiers and they seem to have awarded the houses based on the, the most um, honourable and uh, uh, soldiers who had a good reputation. So if you'd been drunk or yeah. you'd been locked up in the stockade a few times you didn't get a house. If you'd lost both your legs or have been a prisoner of war, you've got a house. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm right. I, I kind of knew they were out there, but as I say, I've, I've only found a few examples, but I was sure there were others out there. I'm glad. Thank you. Uh, one observation and one question. Uh, the observation is that you mentioned about knitting. Um, I came across some school magazines uh, dating back to the First World War, and uh, the girls were sending money for bread for prisoners of war and it named the soldiers that they were actually oh, right. buying with yeah. bread. And uh, they were also feeding a civilian prisoner of war who was at uh, Relayman Camp. Yeah. And uh, there were letters which he had written back to the girls in the magazine, so magazines were obviously useful. Mm. My question is, I'm, I'm trying to find um, munitions factories in the area with little success. Was there um, a national register of munitions factories? It will be in the Ministry of Munitions papers at Kew. Um, which are, the papers are voluminous. Huge <coughs> amounts of, of, of paperwork. Uh, their search engine... Well, I preferred their old one, but then I'm old-fashioned. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure there would, there would be a central register of the main ones. Of course, so much stuff was subcontracted. That's the problem. Um, and whether the records for the factory that did the subcontracting would be there, I have my doubts. But the main factories, yes. But they would subcontract, as they did in the Second World War, to garages that repaired cars would produce small amounts of material 
which would then go to the to the munitions factories. So I suppose it depends on your definition of what a munitions factory is, but there would be a central register in the munitions papers, it's MUN series of the National titles. Archives. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they... Um, they now have a new system whereby if any... So many government departments have sprung up since 1960. In the old days, it was ADM for Admiralty, WO for War Office, AIR for AIR, uh, PEM for Pensions, MUN for Munitions. So many government departments now that they have a pre-prepared pre list of um, departmental categories, which when a government department that existed for five years in the 1970s, decides to release its papers. It might have been uh, the Department for Speed Development in Aircraft, but it will get a reference of ZK, because that's the next one on the list. So. <laughs> but it's a sign of how much government has grown over the last 50 years that they've had to do that. So. Yeah. Peter? Um, I got my wife to look at uh, some of the appeals stuff uh, against conscription, because it was all in shorthand, just as a, a, a note. Unfortunately, shorthand's changed over the years, and it's quite difficult. But our area is agricultural. My question really is, with the appeals, do you know what the effect on agricultural production was in the war? You know, did they, were they able to produce enough food, or I heard more about the Second World War with that. But they, there was a. a an equivalent of the Women's Land Army in the First World War. Uh, massive numbers of German prisoners of war were used on the land, again as in the Second World War. I think there was a desperate shortage of labour. Um, and of course that combined with the submarine attacks on shipping meant that they did have to introduce rationing, which was against everything, another one of those things they really didn't want to have to do in 1917. So, Yes, it did affect the, layout, the the amount of food produced, but I couldn't provide you with figures. I can't actually answer the business about figures, but my mother, who was born in 1900 and lived her life in London during the war, talked about the fact that Londoners uh, were actually using cart grease as spread on bread when they could get bread because there was no butter and the margarine was unspeakable yeah. and they actually used, now she may have been well given to exaggeration, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm perfectly sure that the big urban centres will have suffered more than those of us who lived out in, in um, more out in the country where we knew somebody who could probably uh, slip us, you know, a little yeah. bit of butter and a bit of fresh milk. But that, that is extent, uh, so, uh, and I had that verbally. Um, I, I so can well believe it. I mean, oddly enough, I've not studied that in this country, but I have studied it in Germany, where, again, the big cities really suffered. Yeah. Um, not so bad in the countryside. If you could get out into the countryside, you'd find a farmer who yes. would... Um, yes. But if you were stuck in the city, you, in Germany at least, by November 1918, you were starving. Yes. So I can well believe it in this country, not thankfully quite as bad, but yes. Yeah. Um, I've um, been looking at rural areas in particular, and as early as, as August 1914, there was uh, great nervousness about getting in the harvest with so many men enlisting. But it really seems to have kicked in uh, as, as a, a problem with Labour, particularly 1917 and 18, and that's when rationing mm. was just beginning to be introduced, particularly the U-boat war. But it was all hands to pump. I mean, it was 250,000 about uniform women's services, women's land army, women's forestry corps, yeah. um, and groups like that. The other thing was they enlisted school children. Uh, collecting fruit for keelers and heartless. Yes. Uh, chestnuts for acetone they, um, in exposes, but I don't think that uh, worked very well. And certainly I found examples of um, the school leaving age uh, being uh, dropped by a year so that they could get more children back into the workforce. And there is a real sense of, um, of, of cry, you know, uh, crisis yeah. and, and, and difficulty. 
and the script that the, the women who served in the women's land army in the forestry called God actually has a wording that says, you know, they were as much on the front line, words to that effect. They were doing as much as our men in the trenches and at sea uh, to make sure we won the war. And, and virtually completely forgotten about it. I mean, as, as were the Women's Land Army in the Second World War until relatively recently. I think that most of them are only still getting the medals that they become entitled to. Uh, but in the First World War, very quickly forgotten about it. They've just opened a memorial at uh, Ar the Arboretum, Arboretum. Yes. Yes. Arboretum yeah. this week. Mm. Well, last question here. Sorry. It, it might be a bit frivolous. I mean, sorry, related to Lord Lansdowne and his chauffeur, there used to be an exhibit, um, exhibit at the um, Army Flying Corps Museum at Little Wallop. Yeah. Um, a lot of the women who could drive at this time were daughters of upper middle class families, and they were at least volunteered to drive army officers around. And this caused a problem because. The officers would normally have been expected to get out first and open the door. <laughs> they were in fact the, the driver for the officer, and so the driver lady had to get out and open the door for the officer. And this caused all sorts of problems, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Well, I think a very suitable end to, uh, to this session. I'm sure you'll all join me in taking the opportunity of thanking Phil for a wonderful talk to start the day. Thank you very much.